afternoon. I hope everyone has had a great day. We're getting towards the end of the day, so I'm sure we're on information overload, which is part of the reason why for this, team, for this particular session we decided to change it up a bit instead of talking at you, having more of a panel and a discussion, so that way it could be a little bit more lively than a single person up here Probably be talking. Um, so I've got two of my, my partners and colleagues that are gonna come up and speak, so I'll, I'll introduce Lindy first, because she's ready. <laughs> Lindy split, sprinted 100 yards. Uh. Yes, yeah, from the edge booth all the way here. Uh, so Lindy, Far edge. would you like to introduce yourself to the group? Absolutely. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Lindy Sabloff. I'm the COO of Guys AI. Guys is focused uh, exclusively on the far edge, and we're going to get into it a little bit, why we feel that that is so critical, but we're solving real-world problems for enterprises, and we're doing it in a way that is a more efficient system, that is more effective and is so beneficial for organizations. So. Yeah. Excellent. And then Darren. Darren, would you like to introduce yourself to the group? Sure. You should be. Oh, no, I'll sit here. Mm -hmm. Hi. Uh, my name is Darren Blue. I work in for the Intel Corporation in our Network and Edge group, specifically in the Federal Industrial Solutions Division. We focus on manufacturing and energy, as well as some federal applications. So what we'll be talking about today is when we focus on, we talk about the edge, we talk about all the way down to the machine, like Lindy's talked about here a little bit, and where AI plays and the control and the data plane and, and how all that comes together uh, and how that's actually gonna move towards the future with, uh, we've all heard of in, um, Industrial 4.0 and the digi digital transformation that's happening in manufacturing. Awesome. So. I'll start with you first, Lindy, with a couple of questions that we have. So when you're working with manufacturing customers, what mm -hmm. do you see some of the biggest challenges that they have? There are a number of challenges with manufacturing, and I think it's funny to think of a large manufacturing plant as being a resource-constrained environment, but it really is. And it be, can be resource-constrained in a number of ways. One, you can have bandwidth issues. Two, you can have network outages. Uh, or three, you have to be much more cost-efficient. Um, and you can't do that by sending all your data to the cloud. The better way to do it is by doing inferencing at the edge where data is actually created. And then Darren. I know that you've spent, we've talked a lot about this, um, you've spent a number of years looking at the challenges that manufacturers have. So when you think about kind of how they're using AI into their factories, how, what problems do you see that solving? Yeah, so um, specifically in North America and Europe, there's a labor shortage. Um, they have difficulty keeping workers. So AI, bringing AI in and trying to replicate some of the knowledge where they've had workers that have been in jobs for 30 plus years and they can't find someone to replace that. Trying to extract some of that knowledge into an AI model is very important. Trying to in, not even be able to hire someone to do say an inspection. So Lindy has a, an inspection uh, use case that she's showing over in her booth. And some of those kind of things as well as just being able to uh, make things run more efficiently. And then with the pandemic that happened, they put things together with bailing twine and duct tape uh, and now they want to put some kind of enterprise solution in place because they, you know, they realize, hey, this was a better way to do it. How do, now do I take that to the next level and make it more permanent? Yeah, I couldn't agree more about uh, you know, the issue of attrition uh, in the workforce. And while AI isn't you know, directly replacing people, I think the way, the way we think about it is we're empowering, empowering field engineers, right? In that AI can be the Iron Man exoskeleton uh, that allows them to do five to ten jobs rather than just their one and then have a huge gap in the workforce. We see a lot of that as well with a lot of the automation that we're, we're starting to put in place in many of the manufacturers, so it definitely gets to the skill challenges, the talent shortage that they may be having. I'm really curious on how you see, and I'll point this at you, Darren, <laughs> Okay, absolutely. Uh, so, with the AI space, I think in the past, we've seen a lot of kind of bolt-on solutions 
that are providing kind of data into manufacturing establishments. But now we're starting to see where AI may be starting to interact with the control systems or in the actual loop. And so I'm curious if you can kind of share what you're seeing from Intel's perspective mm -hmm. on what the manufacturers are doing there. Well, and, and let me tie this into the demo a little bit that we have and we're showing with Kelly and her team. Um, so the, if you look at the control systems that have been in place for and worked very well for a long time, they weren't really necessarily built uh, with the instantiation of AI in the future. They weren't necessarily built as data systems. So when you start thinking about data and the IT types of solutions, you've got to come up with an infrastructure that can handle and flow that data. Um, and at the same time, as you start adding these devices in and the factories get bigger, there's more and more devices, you've got to find a way to integrate those things and manage those things. So that virtualization technology, that data flow, those containers, being able to put all those together and then have more remote manageability, more remote lifecycle management is what's coming into play as this whole transformation is beginning to happen. We're, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be a some time till this happens, obviously, because um, the manufacturers are not going to replace it till they you know, see the benefit and, and need to do it. But that's what's kind of happening. That's what we're showcasing in the, the demo. And that's what's the value prop that's going to happen over time as people start making that transition. They start uh, seeing what the art of the possible is with AI and then want to feed that back into their control type solutions. I think that's really interesting. So I know like Lindy, uh, your team is predominantly focused in the computer vision space, but I know that from discussions that we've had, you're starting to see just like the natural interaction of just AI in connection with even computer vision and the data coming from control systems. So how is guys kind of preparing for these changes that are coming to manufacturing? That's a great question. I think we need to take a little bit of a step back. I think there still, unfortunately, is this persistent notion that AI models are large, that they're cumbersome, and that they're expensive. And I think really when we need to start talking about the edge, there are a couple things we need to get across. One, you can have these incredibly powerful but lightweight algorithms, right? Uh, I, I like to joke around, it's, it's Robin Williams' genie in, in, in the 90s version of Aladdin where he pops out of the lamp and he goes, phenomenal cosmic power, itty bitty living space. And that's really how we have to start thinking about uh, you know, edge-enabled AI and that these models are available, and they are, uh, pardon the overuse of the term transformational, but they really are transformational. And I think from an adoption standpoint, it's going to help really start accelerating adoption to be able to have you know, these different algorithms for specific use cases that can run on you know, very lightweight but you know, small compute um, and is absolutely critical. Um, and especially, you know, one of the reasons we, we, we've partnered with Intel, uh, you know, is the ability to, uh, to optimize uh, on OpenVINO, right? And that, you know, when you're doing quantization, you can drastically increase the FPS, and then you're lowering, you know, the, the memory uh, consumption. And so it makes it so these models uh, can, run, uh, can run on small compute and can run very efficiently. But the other thing I think to think about an edge is not just how AI has shifted uh, to fit manufacturing, to, you know, to fit energy, uh, and to fit uh, uh, you know, other industries. It's also to say uh, that you know, it's about scalability, right? And by having lightweight mo models, it is more scalable, but lightweight models that are agnostic and can run on different devices and also take input from all you know, the proliferation of IoT sensors that are out there. I'll stop it. Yeah. Actually, I would love, Darren, for yeah. you to kind of chime in on this because I know we've spent a lot of time talking about embedded system developers and how different they are. There's actually some of them in the audience because I know some of them. Uh -huh. and the way that they operate is a little bit different and the way they think about how to build the applications or even the AI models will be different. So I'm, I'm really curious for you to kind of share what Intel is trying to do in this space with, especially with the use of OpenVINO to help with some of that optimization. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that this, this transformation, this whole thing we've been talking about actually opens up space for the developers. And one of the things I actually hear from the manufacturers is um, the systems of the past, because they were pretty vertically integrated because 
um, that was necessary, when you start opening it up to more of an IT type of environment, you can get developers. And so the complaint from the manufacturers, I get innovation only from one company. When I can open it up and create a more open system, I get innovation from all the developer community. I get, um, I, I have my own people that can write. I can buy stuff from the developer community. I can uh, hire contractors. I can even sell my own back out to the developer community. And so uh, we, as Intel, try to encourage that as a solution space uh, so that you know, it advances everything much faster. You get more eyes on the whole thing. You get more innovation happening. And then that drives the whole um, transformation forward. And do you have, um, I know that we may not be able to talk about specific logos, like specific customers, but do you have an example of how this has worked with, in the past with you um, and, and the work that you've done with some of the manufacturers? With the manufacturers? Yeah. Um, well, it, it's still very early in this transformation, so the developer community is still kind of spinning up. Uh, but, it, it, you know, like she mentioned, OpenVINO has had a lot of success. And so there are a, a lot of companies out there using, like, you know, you've got, I've got one sitting here. Like, we would consider her as a developer, right? And so she's taking that OpenVINO space and moving it forward. We've got something that expands upon that with a data bus called Edge Insights for Industrial that is also being used by some system integrators to deliver some video um, applications as well. So those are actually continuing to move forward and, and be evaluated and, and taking more. So right now it is more in the video inspection space, but I yep. think you're gonna see that expand into more and more use cases as it goes forward. Okay, that's great. And so Lindy, on your side with your team, as you're looking at some of these new use cases and the interaction with customers, can you describe for the team like what that engagement model really starts to look like? Mm -hmm. Because I know that you have a starting point of a model, and then that's where your team really kind of engages to the customer environment. Yeah, it, it, while there is some you know, one size fits all in, in, in terms of AI models, you're always gonna have you know, a certain bit of specification for the customer, right? And especially to maintain accuracy, you know, AI is about iteration. Um, and so as you go in, you know, and you're working with the customers, um, you know, to understand, you know, their needs from a hardware perspective, uh, power consumption, uh, you know, what, what is the bandwidth you know, available. Um, and so, you know, going in and really being able to very rapidly, um, it's not a completely bespoke solution, but, it, but at least customize so that you can achieve high levels of accuracy, uh, depending on the customer. Okay, so now I'm gonna ask you the thing that, because I work for Red Hat, I should ask you this. So let's talk about how we've been working together. Mm -hmm. And so in particular, let's talk about the work with Armada mm -hmm. and uh, the system that has been built um, and the role that you see some of the open source technologies that Red Hat provides brings to the AI space. Oh, I am an unabashed fan uh, of, of Red Hat. Um, I, you know, I, I think you know, pri prior to working with Red Hat, we looked at some solutions that, you know, you know gum and shoelace, right? That we, we, we made it work, um, but it wasn't, it wasn't efficient, and it, and it certainly wasn't scalable, right? And at the end of the day, the customer needs something that is as close to turnkey as possible. They, don't, they need something that they don't have to add IT personnel uh, and that doesn't take you know, in tens of hours uh, of, of training. They need something that they can install, turn on, and use that is going to make a difference in what they're doing, you know, be it manufacturing, be it oil and gas. Um, and so where Red Hat has been critical to us, you know, especially a Red Hat device edge. I think you know, we had looked at you know, different Kubernetes solutions, but when you're talking about the far edge and you're talking about some very small uh, compute, uh, Kubernetes is, is just a little too heavy. And so we were introduced to Ansible uh, a little over a year ago, and it's made a significant difference. Uh, and I think that opened our eyes to say, we can actually create an entire edge ops platform uh, around it. So we've actually integrated Ansible inside, uh, you know, doing the callbacks and orchestration inside our edge ops platform. So that's one. Uh, two, you know, 
especially RHEL 9 has been absolutely marvelous. Uh, so using RHEL 9 and Podman, uh, and, and then you know, to replace Docker, uh, and then also um, using Quay as our image registry. So we consume an incredible amount <laughs> of, of Red Hat products, but it really has made a significant difference. And I think, you know, Kelly, you and I have had a number of discussions. You know, as we go out, you know, getting back to that idea that you have to provide a turnkey solution uh, to a customer, you really need a best of breed partner ecosystem. Because I think as we all go out, if we don't have unified messaging uh, and, we, and we can't come in and say, here is your solution. And a solution isn't just the software, the solution you know, you know, is the hardware, it's the processors, you know, it, it is you know, the ability to, to optimize with, with OpenVINO. To come in and say, here, you know, XYZ Corp, this can, you know, can, can go right into your manufacturing plan. This is, this is going to be your base for how we begin automation. Um, and it is critical to get those components right, uh, but to have you know, a, a glove in hand kind of go to market with all the partners. So there isn't so much noise when you go in. Uh, and so Red Hat, not just from a product standpoint, has, has been fantastic. Uh, and, and Intel as well, you know, working with a number uh, 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 different departments uh, within the company, but everybody goes in and says, "How are we going to get this done? How are we going to create that turnkey solution?" Uh, and it is such a difference when we sit in front of the customers and we all say, "Here's here's your sheet. This is how we're going to do it. Here's your solution. You know, let's begin." Um, and it, it's it, it's been incredible. So. Yeah. Well, I think I I love uh, the power of. The, the user interface that you guys have built that allows for the seamless kind of um, not only um, cataloging of the devices and the locations that you're pointing specific models to in the cameras, uh, but how seamless it is for uh, the deployment. So I'll shamelessly plug Red Hat with that because the, the deployment of all the models within their platform um, is they use Ansible for that and then it obviously runs on, on the Podman container system with RHEL. Um, now with that, because we've been doing a lot of this work, what's great is that when I look at the work we've been doing with Intel and we look at the control systems, which becomes like the happy marriage of bringing the control along with the data and analytics together, we start to see a lot of commonalities in the architecture. And so if we look at, as an example, Darren, the, the infamous water tank demo that is um, with uh, Schneider Electric right. uh, in our edge booth, I know that we see a lot of similarities in some of the technology that's used. But do you want to share with share for the group, just in case they haven't been to our booth, how that's all working with the water tank demo? Absolutely. So um, this is a journey we've been on for a little bit. Uh, we pieced some Frankenstein, some stuff together in the lab initially. Uh, and then over the last year or so, we've worked with Red Hat and, and Schneider Electric to put together commercial software, actually, to bring in more to reality. So. We have a simulating a process control uh, demo on the edge area on the floor <clears throat> using general purpose compute. Um, so some edge devices that use a two core Elkhart Lake and uh, tied to a server that uses Red Hat Edge Linux along with Ansible and a runtime from <clears throat> Schneider Electric to control the, the level of two tanks with one of them draining into the other constantly and it controls a variable speed pump to keep a constant level on the top tank. So, um, the, and it can do bumpless failover, uh, which is very important to, when you're in a control environment so that you know, nothing ever loses. And then Ansible detects that something failed, spins a new one up, and then you, you get the redundancy back into place. And so if you haven't seen it, please go over and see my friends Rob and, and Jeremy. They'll be happy to take you through all that. But the other plus to that then is you've got general purpose compute right at the machine level, right out on the floor that allows you to do other things that you might want to try. So you can deploy a, a vision case or you can deploy a machine learning that takes time series data and does something, uh, you know, if you're, if you're pulling information off of a, a welder that's just with arc and electricity, et cetera, to do different things. So, uh, that allows you to do a lot of different things you can, and so, you know, that general purpose computer on the floor allows you remote manageability, allows you that uh, to do those other things as well, right there on the floor, and then 
you know, the things that we still have to, to do is, you know, make sure that all of that creates the determinism, that creates the reliability as we move this forward. And there are some deployments being tested actually in real factories and real areas that uh, we'll get some feedback on for that. So it, whenever that moves forward and it gives, then that gives the sort of the, the sandbox for people to explore and what they can really do when you get that kind of opportunity right at the machine. I think that's a great point. So what we're starting to see in the factories is people putting more general compute in their factories. Some would call it like a mini data center, but the intent is then for it to be able to take a lot of the data that may be coming off of the control systems, place it within their historian, which is basically a time series database, and be able to do advanced analytics on it. But in addition to that, because they have the general compute there, you can run additional inferencing applications if you need something that's a larger compute or potentially you, you can get away with not having it directly connected to the camera on that exact same box. So we start to get into more general purpose where in manufacturing today, I think many of them are, are much more accustomed to everything has one specific purpose, right. lots of small computers, and so that you've got a ton of compute that requires a ton of hardware refresh, a ton of software updates uh, when they can get to more of this general compute and start some of the, I don't really like the word, but it's used all the time, the workload consolidation. Mm -hmm. uh, they're not really workloads to me if they're running your business um, they, because they are literally deciding whether you make money. But um, I know that uh, workload is a pretty common <laughs> <laughs> Key term. Well, well, and it, you know, obviously that's very important um, for us at Intel and the, yeah. to move towards that general purpose compute. But uh, I'll steal a phrase from, I work with um, uh, Dr. Henning Loser from Audi and been working for him for a while. He was on stage at an ARC conference uh, and his, his point was today I do have to buy a dedicated box. In the future, I just want to buy an application I can load on, then I can even try it without having to, you know, go buy a whole box, install all this stuff, and if it doesn't work, I just, you know, take the application back out, and I can try something else. And I can try three from different places and decide which one I like the best. So not only does it give him opportunity to try uh, to, to manage his whole factory a lot better, but it gives him the opportunity to try different options from different places, as, as simple as, maybe not quite as simple because it is a manufacturing environment, as, downloading an application on your phone. That is very interesting. We've had a lot of discussion actually in the Edge booth around, uh, can we just put QR codes on everything and then people can easily scan the, the hardware as it comes in with all the software they need and just plug it in. So there is definitely the concept of making things simple, uh, especially in manufacturing, which I know that you brought up as well, mm -hmm. Lindy. And so when we think about how we may build AI systems, uh, for manufacturing in the future. Like if you were going to give the audience uh, a little bit of advice, what would be kind of the three things that you would tell them to think about that they have to keep in mind when they're going to do AI in a factory? It's a great question. I, I think there are a couple, couple things there. You know, one, you know, how are you gonna scale, right? You know, especially when you're thinking about a factory or not just one factory, but multiple factories across multiple geographies. Um, so how are you going to scale? And you, you touched on that earlier. It's kind of why we built our, our you know, our Mata Edge Ops platform uh, is to make, you know, scaling simple, um, you know, across so that you can either run, you know, in, in, in the cloud, uh, you know, or actually on the edge server itself. Um, you know, I think the other thing, you know, there as well is how are you going to keep your data secure? And so we've added an encryption layer uh, as well that you need to encrypt at the device level and you need to make sure that those device, you know, edge is much, much more difficult than cloud uh, when, it, when it comes to security. So you have to make sure that you have the right system in place so that somebody can't just come up and, and walk away with, with that Intel NUC, right? Uh, that if that happens, then you don't have any compromises. Um, and you know, you need to think about, you know, what are the parameters in the manufacturing plant itself? You know, is energy consumption uh, a, a critical factor for you? Um, is cost, uh, you know, a critical factor for you? I think the power of the edge is that you can have hundreds, if not thousands of, of heterogeneous devices, but 
you know, I think this is why we, we, we've, we've partnered with Intel, is that Intel really gets that uh, in a way that other companies that we work with uh, have not. Um, and that, you know, you really can run, you know, on, on small compute. And uh, the edge is a volume game. Um, and you need the right partners who understand that, who can build, uh, you know, the right hardware and the right infrastructure along with you as you go out and as you start building, uh, you know, the different AI use cases. Darren, same question for you. Well, I'm going to just build on what she said <laughs> yeah, um, and expand on it. So, absolutely, the security, the intrinsic security, I think, is is comes across as very important. The other thing I'm going to say about the scalability is what you see is uh, people will put in, they'll test something over here, and they'll test something over there, and they'll test a third thing, and then they start putting in a fourth thing, and then the plant manager, or the owner, or the engineering manager will come in and go like, well, we need a data platform, and none of these things connect to it. Now I've got all these disparate systems that I want to connect. I've got to start all over, and so they get upset. Uh, so you have to think about, as you start growing, you need to think about your data platform and how that goes. And then... The other piece of when you start installing AI is, um, are you going to close the loop? Mm -hmm. So what I find is, okay, well, I know what's wrong now, but I, how am I, what am I going to do about it? Mm -hmm. And so, because in some cases, we've, we've done some you know, POCs and stuff with vision, and, if, and we can tell you whether something's going good or bad in milliseconds. But all we can do right now, um, because the systems aren't quite there yet, is stop the machine and have somebody come over and go, oh, okay, let's do what we can. Yeah. And so the next question is, well, how do we connect all these things together and close that loop? How do I make it so that it becomes more and more autonomous, which we see as moving forward? I'm, I'm smiling because I feel like you set that up for me perfectly with <laughs> our edge ops platform, our, Armada does. Um, you know, especially with, uh, with IoT devices and, and, and cameras, uh, you know, there's a whole layer in there that actually allows you to uh, start and stop processing, uh, you know, look at camera angle, uh, you know, set, set your ROI. So you know, if you're doing uh, optical uh, character recognition, you can say, you know, focus in on, on this component uh, of, the, of the thing. So you can, there's some amount of self-correction uh, built into it, again, making it more simple uh, for the customer to use. Um, Excellent. So I want to thank both of you for coming and talking about the work that you're doing for AI and manufacturing. I think that we've got a little bit of time, so we'll definitely, like, let's stick around and see what questions that the group may have, because I have a feeling there may be some. Like this gentleman right here seems to be <laughs> very interested in the question. Yes? Uh, so quickly, when you're talking about the security edge, that's really more difficult. Mm -hmm. Why is, is it just a physical security or is it actually a cybersecurity thought? It, it, it's much more about physical security, right? Because if you're moving data to, to the cloud, then you, you only have you know, one, you know, one, one issue. When you're talking about the edge, um, you're talking about tens if not thousands of devices that somebody, and these are small devices that somebody could literally come unplug, put in their pocket, and walk away with. Um, and if you're talking about computer vision, depending on the use case and depending on the privacy level, if you're oil and gas, you have some very proprietary information on that device. If, if you haven't encrypted at the device level and then attached that, you know, kind of glove in hand to the network properly, you have a big problem. Um, and so it's not like somebody's coming in and you know lugging you know some big server out of there that somebody's going to notice. When you're talking you know when you're talking about an, a, a you know an Intel NUC or, or, or an SDM uh, or, or Raspberry Pi, right? These are things that are very easy to tuck you know tuck into a pocket and, and, and walk out with. But, but I think there's also a piece in the the cyber piece. Like if you're talking about the control yes. system, that is very true. Um, when I talk to manufacturers, the intrinsic security I'm mentioning is. Their security today is an air gap. Like if you would, if you wanted to mess with a refinery, you'd have to run through the door and turn a handle on a valve, right? If it now becomes connected, um, everyone outside the cement box outside the cement box that the control system resides in today, um, everyone kind of has the somebody hacked into Target through the yep. air conditioner or something. If if somebody does that to a refinery. 
it's a bad day for the neighborhood, right? I mean, in something in that case, or uh, and so they're obviously very sensitive to making sure that that something like that cannot happen, right? Uh, right? Those are, are very important things, and they want to make sure that as the system is built, security is thought and built in as it's uh, created. So I think you have to think about what maybe is taking place within a factory. So if you think about um, whether it's a refinery or it's an actual you know, physical factory like making automobiles, there is human life that is at risk most of the time when you're thinking about what happens in these facilities. Mm -hmm. Whereas when you're thinking about kind of endpoints off of the, the uh, ingress or egress from the cloud, that's just application and data. Well, privacy and data security are still really important. There's a, a slightly different dynamic when you're talking about the risk of human life. And it's not just the, the risk of human life of the people that are working in the factory, but as I kind of joked with some people when they were looking at the demo around the water tank, what happens if this, you know, the water tank overflows? Well, in real life, things could go boom. And that also means that, you know, neighborhoods and you yeah. know, people outside of the working condition could be at risk. So many of these systems have to be designed very differently from a security standpoint because while they may not be a government entity, I think many may consider them to be like national infrastructure on thinking about how these particular industries may run. It's more than securing the actual hardware, yes. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. The idea I was thinking about the more than cybersecurity, you yep. said obviously more exposure information. And so I was thinking of securing it at the edge. And the immediate forefront for me when I think of security at the edge is I think of, okay, cybersecurity, then physical security, and controlling and that aspect of it. I didn't think of environmental. Hello, Steve. Hey, it's nice to see you again. <laughs> I'm thinking of the same thing. Yeah. Like, I worked for years as a uh, OSAP and sort of scan all the holes for the uh, uh, control of access. And when you're dealing with edge and you're dealing with manufacturing environments, it's really, really hard to control. So you control the security of the data on the platform, encryption of that, et cetera. Uh, with all of the software supply chain issues, Mm -hmm. And then that's where partners come in because they understand all the other industrial centric contacts or you know, the, the customer centric contacts that they're trying to live in. Whether it's these devices have to live in very, very uh, extreme temperature environments, extreme humidity environments, power constrained environments. And so, like, again, this is the whole thing about the way we are. You ask the question that's causing a lot of the answers I wanted to hear from the table. But yeah, the secure context for this is so broad. What would you put a device in manufacturing plants or in a bus stop? You know, if that device goes missing, someone walks out the plant with it. How critical is the data? And at the moment, you're doing anything with cameras, regardless of the setting. 
GDPR compliance. Yep. Yeah, the GDPR compliance is, is critical if, uh, the second you step foot in Europe. But I want to piggyback off something you said as well that I think it, what's critical to think about in terms of the edge is what you don't want to do when, uh, when you're talking about security is create you know, a very tedious environment uh, as well. So you need kind of a good soft handshake between uh, the edge device uh, and, and the edge server. Uh, that you're running, so that you can make it so that these things, you know, are 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 automated. Uh, they are repeatable. Um, you don't want something having to go, and you know, you don't want to unlock the door every single time you have to run an application. So. Yeah. something in the service that's more secure and hard, and at that point, is this, this security even easier at the edge? Because in, in my head, and honestly, from my experience, from an experienced head, um, I think of the edge, if you do it right, with the zero trust architecture, and you segment your network correctly, and you have the correct thing in place, that the edge would probably be the place you could start hardening the most, and then let loose the antlers, other than physical I think that's one aspect of it, you know. But you know, let, let, let's take what they're doing with, with Schneider Electric, right? In, in terms of that demo, like when you start automating, you know, th those systems, you have to make sure that somebody can't take them over externally uh, yeah. Yeah. as well. Uh, and I, I think it's there are a lot of different things, you know, going on with that, you know, especially also n not from the security aspect, you know, but the other thing, you know, and I'll get back to an earlier point I made, AI is about iteration, right? It, you can't just have a set it and forget it for a model, otherwise your accuracy is going to drop over time. Uh, and so you do have to have that, you know, a good, easy to use management layer so you can push updates, so you can manage, you know, one of the things we've added to it recently, and I'm excited to demo this for you soon, uh, is we've actually added a, a data layer uh, to it. So we've created a data store, so now you can pull uh, you know, either you know, the inferencing, the JSON uh, data, or the image data, pull it back to the edge server, and so you can actually do retraining at the edge. So you've made the system actually a little bit more secure because you don't have to bring any data off of the edge in order to do re retraining. So, slightly different aspect yeah. of, of security, but critical nonetheless. So. All right. Any other questions? I'm, we're what's stopping people from being able to have a drink. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I fully appreciate that. So, thank you all very much for coming. Uh, really appreciate your time. And uh, if you have any other questions for us, you will find us in, in the Edge booth in the, the exhibit hall. If you haven't seen it, we have lots of really cool stuff that you actually get to physically see. It's not just a, a display screen. So Best booth. Uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so come on down. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thanks. Thanks.